for the continuation of the debate in the Scottish Government's programme for government 2017-18. I call Derek Mackay, followed by Myrtle Fraser. Six minute speeches, please. Presiding officer, this year's programme for government is focused on the wealth and well-being of our communities. And I relish the opportunity ahead as the Economy Secretary having engaged comp comprehensively over the summer months. The PFG has a strong emphasis on boosting our economy. We will increase investment in Scotland's infrastructure, so it is £1.5 billion per year more by the end of the next Parliament than in 2019-20. This increased investment the most ambitious long-term level of infrastructure spend that Scotland has ever seen will drive connectivity, create jobs and deliver a long-term boost to productivity. In total, this means around £7 billion of extra infrastructure investment over the period. And it will help us support faster broadband, improve transport and more low-carbon energy. In a further transformational move, will now embark on the legislation and capitalisation of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Today I launched a consultation on how the bank can support Scotland's economy. We will listen to the views from across Scotland on the bank's objectives, purpose, priorities for investment and governance. And I believe this is a game changer in the provision of patient capital to finance, innovation and growth. And it will be pivotal and our ambitions for a future-proofed, high-tech and low-carbon Scottish economy. This year, we'll also... I will. Jackie Bailey. I've managed to have a very quick look at this consultation. There seems to be something like £30 million set aside for staffing, and the Scottish Government hasn't excluded the payment of bonuses. I wonder whether he would like to do so now. I, Derek I, 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 I think it would be wrong to prejudge every element uh, of the consultation. Naturally, we want to hear uh, from uh, stakeholders in that regard. But no, I will not follow the worst practices of the banking sector in that regard. And we will build a bank that Scotland will be proud of. But this year, we will begin a Reaching 100 programme, delivering a £600 million investment to make superfast broadband available to every home and business in Scotland. This will ensure that the whole country can reap the benefits of the digital revolution. And on exports, our investment for the future will make Scotland an even better place to live, work and invest. More competitive internationally and attract talent and investment from around the world. Investment at home and a determination to boost export opportunities. And that is why we're investing £20 million to help more of Scotland's businesses to engage with e-commerce for export, delivering support to existing exporters to ramp up overseas activity and setting up a new scheme that will create business-to-business -business peer mentorships for new exporters to learn from established exporters. Businesses across Scotland told us they want a more streamlined business support system and that's why we're developing a single digital point of entry for business support along with quicker, technology-driven decisions on financial support. We're also introducing criteria now to ensure that business support grants, such as regional selective assistance, deliver on our ambition to be a world-leading fair work nation. In the coming months, our enterprise and skills agencies will also be stepping up their support for businesses to navigate through Brexit. And we move swiftly to implement the Barclay Rates Review recommendations and will now bring forward a non-domestic rates bill to take forward the remaining legislative elements, such as moving to a valuation cycle that better reflects proper property values and delivers incentives for growth. Our economic actions will touch every part of Scotland. We've committed to investing over £1 billion in city region deals, creating thousands of jobs and upskilling local labour markets across Scotland. Beyond our cities, we will legislate to establish a South of Scotland enterprise agency that supports a diverse and resilient economy in the region. And despite the UK government's Brexit bungling, Scotland's economy has proven to be resilient, benefiting from the Scottish government's progressive initiatives. Economic growth, GDP over the last year has been higher than in the rest of the UK. And I look forward to the opposition parties welcoming that. 
youth unemployment. Of course, this Mark must be the welcome. On that point, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I wonder if you noticed in the Fiscal Commission's report that came out this morning, talking about this issue of GDP growth in Scotland, they said, and I quote, these revisions don't, in our view, affect the subdued outlook for trend growth. Maybe he's getting carried away with his enthusiasm just a bit too soon. Get it, Mackay. I, I, I'm just enthusiastic because we're outperforming the United Kingdom. That's what the... <laughs> that's... That's the... Uh, I think one is plenty for the moment. Thank you, Jackie Bailey. But economic growth outperforming the United Kingdom over the last year and the last quarter specifically. Outperforming the UK on youth unemployment in terms of reducing it and women's unemployment is lower than the rest of the United Kingdom as well. And unemployment overall remaining at near record low levels. Scotland has narrowed the productivity gap with the rest of the UK over the past decade and exports are up 12% in the last year. So I believe that the measures within this programme for government will deliver a step change in infrastructure and business support, delivering for the economy of today and laying the foundations for the opportunities of the future. And I look forward to that debate ahead. I call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, in her statement to Parliament yesterday, the First Minister started by talking about Scotland's economy. Sadly, there was very little actually in the programme that would help grow Scotland's economy, but let's have a look at what is on offer. Rather predictably, we heard all the usual negativity about the likely impacts of Brexit on the Scottish economy. But then in a statement demonstrating a fairly astonishing lack of self-awareness, even for the current First Minister, she went on to trumpet the increase in the export of goods from Scotland by 12%, a significant figure. But it doesn't take an economic genius to understand that a principal reason why exports have grown so dramatically, both in Scotland and indeed across the UK as a whole, has been because of the fall in the value of the pound against other currencies over the past two years. And that fall is a direct result of, guess what, the Brexit vote. So the very problem area that the First Minister has identified for the economy is actually delivering the dramatic export growth that she champions. And it's not just exports that are doing well. Another sector in Scotland that is booming is tourism, to the extent that in some parts of the country we are even talking about the problem of over-tourism. Holidaying in the Highlands this summer, I was very pleased to see the very large number of overseas visitors, particularly coming from Europe, coming to enjoy our scenery, our culture and our hospitality, and all benefiting from a very favourable exchange rate. Similarly, more and more UK visitors are staycationing, taking advantage both of the good weather we've had and the more competitive costs of holidaying at home. Now, I accept the very Brexit that has created boom conditions in industries such as tourism has, of course, presented challenges. There are hospitality providers struggling to recruit staff from European countries because it is no longer so financially attractive for them to come here. And the same applies to other industries such as, as agriculture. But to suggest, as the First Minister did, that the impacts of Brexit thus far on our economy have all been negative is simply dismissing the evidence that we have before us. So what is in the programme for government to help the economy? Well, there is legislation to establish a South of Scotland enterprise agency, a policy we welcome, indeed, a policy pinched from our manifesto in 2016. There is to be a new bill on non-domestic rates to implement some of the recommendations of the Barclay Review, and much of that is welcome. The relief for new build properties, that will help grow the economy uh, and, and property improvements, and the exemptions for day nurseries. And some of the process issues, the move to a three-year cycle for revaluations, will also be beneficial. But it remains our view that the Barker Review was a missed opportunity for a more fundamental review of business taxation in Scotland. And in particular, retail continues to suffer as a sector with pressure on traditional high streets. The large business supplement set in Scotland at a rate nearly double that applicable in the rest of the United Kingdom continues to be a burden on Scottish retailers and creates a competitive disadvantage for Scottish traders, which does need to be addressed. The non-domestic rates bill will no doubt address the issue of rates on independent schools with an intention of implementing the SNP's policy objective of removing the current exemption. 
And it's always seemed to me totally illogical that the same Barclay Review, which proposes a new exemption from business rates for children's nurseries, which provide education, many of which both charge fees and are profit-making, at the same time proposes removing a business rates exemption from independent schools, which are charitable institutions, not making a profit. It is a, an approach as bizarre as it is illogical. And already a real problem has developed in that there are a whole range of independent schools providing specialist support for children with additional support needs, such as the new school at Butterston in Perth and Kinross, which will be hit with business rates unless a way can be found to exempt them. And undoubtedly, it will be a significant challenge to parliamentary draftsmen to draw a distinction in law between independent schools which provide a general education, but with some pupils with special needs, and for those schools which are set up almost exclusively for pupils with those needs. This is not just an issue about education, it's also an economic one. In Perth and Kinross, there are at least eight independent schools I, I'm aware of, having a significant economic contribution to the local economy, supporting around 500 direct jobs and many more indirectly in the wider economy. And it's a major earner, of course, of foreign revenue from students coming from overseas. To hit this important economic sector with a new tax burden flies in the face of everything we've been told by this SNP government. To quote directly from the First Minister yesterday, she said this, we will ensure that the business environment in Scotland I, let me just finish this quote, I'll give away. Um, we will ensure, in the last minute, it will have to be very quick. We will ensure that the business environment in Scotland remains competitive and that we're providing the support the businesses need to thrive. Not these businesses, it sounds like. I'll give away. Derek Mackay. Ask Mr Fraser, is he aware of the proportion of non-domestic rates relief uh, as a proportion to the overall running cost for an average uh, independent mainstream school? I, I Martin Fraser. I, I don't have the figure at the tip of my finger, what I can say is to add an additional burden, I think we're talking about an aggregate £5 million to a sector that is important both educationally and economically flies in the face of everything else this government has said about growing the economy. But it seems the Education Secretary, who I'm afraid has now left the Chamber, does recognise the issue because he wrote over the summer on behalf of constituents to the Finance Secretary raising these concerns. And what was the Finance Secretary's response? To suggest that the local authority, Perth and Ross Council, could somehow find the money in their budget a budget he and his predecessor have slashed to make up the difference. Presiding officer, we've had to sit in this chamber month after month, year after year, while SNP ministers complain they have to use their resources to mitigate the policy choices of a Westminster government on welfare and elsewhere. And yet here we have SNP ministers having the brass neck to play exactly that same trick on local authorities that they claim Westminster is playing on them. Was there ever anything quite so shameless, presiding officer? In conclusion, I think this is an unambitious programme for government. It's indicative of a party in government running out of ideas, lacking in enthusiasm and short on ambition. It really must do better than this. Thank you. Call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's been an interesting uh, opening uh, observation from the Conservative benches. It's the first time I've heard uh, someone like Murdo Fraser boasting that the pound in his pocket is worth less than it was um, before Conservative uh, uh, the policies and actions uh, affected it. And I welcome what he'll say in two years' time when the effect of higher costs for importing components that are required for manufacturing industry in these islands will really hit home. Short-term benefit, long-term, much more uh, problematic. But Brexit uh, is something that we should talk about in terms of uh, the economy. It's a huge challenge to the Scottish economy, to the economy uh, in these islands. But the one thing it will not do is inhibit this government in taking the actions that will support Scotland's further development uh, from here on. I want to just say a few words about a few of the things uh, in the yesterday's statement from the First Minister. Uh, and uh, before talking about banking, I remind people of my register of interests in relation to banking. Uh, I, of course, spent 30 years in banking and came into politics to improve my reputation. <laughs> the Scottish uh, National Investment Bank uh, is something I very much uh, support. The world of finance and of cash 
and of the way it works is fundamentally changing for businesses, but even more so it will uh, for individuals. For example, in Sweden, there are now only 25 bank branches in Sweden who deal with cash, because essentially it's become a cashless society. We'll get there as well. And I think uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank primarily focusing on investment in the first instance, could look in the longer term at how we can support communities who were going to lose, as they are already, more and more uh, local branches so that the right kind of financial services there. And that often will be uh, through technology assisted by uh, trained people. So I hope the investment bank might in the long term look at that. The biometrics bill I very much welcome. Um, I encourage the government to take close attention to what's happened in India with the Aadhaar system, which is an identity card system which has got 1.22 billion cardholders uh, issued since 2009. The um, important point about it is that 50% or so of the cardholders are functionally illiterate. So therefore, it's an easy access system. It has many lessons for the sort of things uh, that we might want to do in relation to biometrics. The Aadha uh, card is based on uh, a retinal scan. We think about uh, electoral reform. I hope that we can persuade uh, the Electoral Commission when they're doing boundary changes <coughs> to perhaps uh, give us more granular details so we can see what houses there are at the edge of our constituency. Not a big deal. On non-domestic rates, one thing I'd like the government to work with the assessors on is how they factor in empty premises into the assessment of value of rent. Because in the northeast of Scotland, fish factories, and there are quite a lot of them are empty, but those that are not empty, they're taking the actual rents paid. But no account has been taken of the fact that it's impossible to let other factories at the rate of rent that the ones that are occupied. So it should be across the board, and the valuers do know about the empty factories because they're looking at them uh, as well. And that's a wee thing. And I'm going to be talking to the valuers about it because I realise the government does not control that subject, but it does provide uh, guidance. Um, now, on infrastructure, I uh, very much welcome the increased uh, investment that is going to be a, a, in infrastructure. I hope that we'll uh, think about uh, whether we can support industries that are going to be particularly hard hit by the absence of uh, people from across Europe, because people are going to go back to Europe because of the immigration rules, and perhaps help the fish processing industry increase its levels of automation, perhaps uh, help the, the soft fruit industry develop new technologies for harvesting, and of course, in turn, creating new products that we can sell uh, around the world. So I hope uh, that these are things that uh, the infrastructure uh, investments might include in the consideration of uh, things they want. But of course, it's up to the industry to come forward with proposals, and I, I have been talking to people in both these industries uh, about what they might do in that regard. Now that's middle term to long term, maybe not immediately short term, but nonetheless important for, for, for that presiding officer. Now I want to, if you'll allow me presiding officer, uh, since there's no motion, uh, to just pick up one thing that is not economy directly, uh, which I'm particularly interested in, and that is the announcements in relation to mental health. Um, in 1964, for eight months I personally worked in uh, mental health as a nurse. Uh, my father-in-law is a psychiatric nurse. My sister-in-law is a psychiatric nurse. So I'm absolutely clear about the value of investing in people's mental health. Diminishing in schools these early signs of mental ill health that might develop into a real, coming back to the economy, cost to the economy, but more fundamentally something that will benefit people in Scotland, improve their lives, not just simply their wallets. Presiding officer. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Presiding officer, I have to confess that the First Minister's programme for government um, sounded to me like a bit of a shopping list. There was no story, no consistent thread underpinning what the government was doing. I left not really knowing what the big picture was. Lots of inputs, but very little on outcomes. And when you look back 
at the previous programme for government announcements. The charge that the SNP over-promise but under-deliver is absolutely true. Only two bills passed last year. And if it was based on performance-related pay, ministers should have their salaries docked. But it's not just about legislation, I accept that. It's also what you do with policy and with the budget. The problem is that the SNP has been timid on all of those fronts. Every measure, every target which the government set for itself on the economy, it has failed. Just look at the seven purpose targets that relate to the economy. Not one of them met. So let me welcome the renewed focus on the economy, because I've no doubt it is badly needed. I particularly welcome the announcement that there will be a new economic strategy, and not before time. Scottish Labour has asked for the economic strategy to be reviewed several times. We asked the First Minister, we asked the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, we did so in 2015, in 2016, in 2017. You would think that Brexit was a sufficiently material and significant change that they would want to make sure that their strategy was fit for purpose. But oh no, on at least three occasions, the SNP voted against a review. So I am really glad that the new Cabinet Secretary does not have his head in the sand like his boss or indeed his predecessor. The second issue for me is honesty. Honesty about the state of the economy. Now, of course, the government will claim that everything is wonderful and the opposition will claim that everything is dire. The truth is, our economy is fragile. Look, I think everyone in this chamber would welcome any rise in GDP. I want our economy to grow. I want us to generate jobs, to generate wealth, and then for us to redistribute that wealth to those who most need it. But don't expect me to jump up and down at rises that are fractions of a percentage point because it is marginal. Forecasts by the Fiscal Commission show growth at less than 1% for a year longer than they originally thought to 2023. That's not a good story. And I want us to do much better than that. And let me say as gently as I can to the Cabinet Secretary, if the limit of our ambition is to just compare ourselves to the UK when the UK itself is performing badly, that's not very clever, nor is it very ambitious. So let me, well, no, let me make progress and then you can come in. So let's compare the state of the Scottish economy to some of our European neighbours. Because I remember the SNP used to talk about emulating the Celtic tiger. That was until the Irish economy tanked. But from 2015 to the first quarter of 2018, Ireland has outperformed Scottish GDP growth in 11 out of the 12 quarters. How about Spain, where the great recession... You see, I hear somebody shouting independence. Actually, no, this was about a significant recession, and what they did themselves didn't require independence, it required determined effort. And how about Spain? Let's talk about Spain and the Great Recession, which lasted until 2015. Unemployment was at 20%. Now Spain is outperforming Scotland in each and every one of the 12 quarters. And in Portugal, where unemployment reached 18% and the European Central Bank had to intervene, their growth, their growth was higher than Scotland's in each of the last 12 quarters. Now, it's interesting to note that there is a socialist government in Portugal that has explicitly rejected austerity and is turning their country round. I invite the SNP to learn a lesson or two from Portugal. I am encouraged by the new focus on exports. There has been too little done in this area in the past. I would also note that we export more to the rest of the UK than we do to the rest of Europe and indeed the world. So strengthening our home market is as important as looking further afield. But where is the focus on productivity? A key driver for economic growth, no mention of it in the First Minister's 45-minute speech. Productivity in Scotland is woeful. The government had a target of lifting productivity to the top quartile of OECD, OECD countries to be achieved by 2017. We started at 18th place in the second quartile. And when we got to 2017, we had slipped to 19th place in the third quartile. Frankly, that's dreadful. Where to is the focus? Absolutely. Derek Mackay. Um, Jackie Bailey has uh, rightly said that we shouldn't try and just match ourselves to UK performance. Of course, we're outperforming compared to the rest of the UK. But when we've looked at small, advanced economies that are more successful 
than Scotland. We have all the economic fundamentals that they have. The one thing that they've got that we've not is independence. Why does Jackie Bailey stand in the way of our economic progress? Jackie Bailey. The interesting thing, because your Cuts Commission report actually spelt it out in terms. With independence comes years of austerity, eye-watering cuts to public services, cuts to schools and hospitals. That's why we reject your flawed notion of a thriving economy. But where is the focus on workers? Much of the recent rises in employment, I think you'd acknowledge, have been characterised by temporary working, by low pay, by zero hours contracts. A report just the other day highlighted the millions that would be injected into the economy in the west of Scotland and Glasgow in particular if more people were on the living wage. I welcome too the eighth re-announcement of the Scottish Na National Investment Bank. I'm disappointed that there is a suggestion that they're going to pay bankers bonuses and I hope that's not the case. Of course, under Scottish Labour's plans, we would see £20 billion invested, 10 times the amount the SNP is proposing because we need to see transformational change. And finally, presiding officer, on infrastructure investment. Scottish Labour have been asking for SFT to be reviewed for many years to secure better value for money. We would deliver £20 billion in capital investment from a national transformation fund in contrast to the SNP. And let me just finish on this point. Scottish Government has new borrowing powers of £450 Please. million pounds each year. How much of that will be used to fund the £1.5 billion announced? How much will come you from the private close, sector? Please. And how much is assumed investment made by local authorities? We look forward to considering this and the funding model in further detail. Can I remind members they should always speak through the chair and not directly to each other? And I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thanks very much, provide, presiding officer. It's uh, worth reflecting, I think, as Richard Leonard did yesterday, that next year is the 20th anniversary of this parliament. And despite our political differences, it's worth celebrating the fact that we actually do have the capacity here in Scotland to introduce new laws and policy uh, for the people we serve. Um, examples of welcome legislation in the programme for government include bills on consumer protection, electoral reform uh, and family law, as well as the announcement that I welcome uh, that government will introduce a bill uh, in this parliament for reform to the law of defamation. I commend Scottish Pen and others on their campaigning on this matter. And in policy terms, uh, we welcome, uh, as many others have, plans for a Scottish National Investment uh, Bank uh, and the launch of the consultation uh, today, want something which could have a transformative impact on the economy if designed and implemented appropriately. We welcome two ambition, ambitions for infrastructure investment, but reiterate our previous calls for this to be focused on low carbon projects, public transport and public housing. Today's debate is themed around the economy. And as a number of speakers have mentioned, we continue to have fundamental problems uh, with uh, the economy. As Greens, we have fundamental problems with the assumptions underpinning the government's economic policy. Economic growth, even inclusive economic growth, is a fundamentally flawed goal if measured by GDP, the aggregate of monetized transactions in the economy. The founder of GDP in the 1930s was Simon Kuznets, who became one of its biggest critics. GDP does not measure goods and services produced in the course of daily life, does not measure the distribution of income or wealth, says nothing at all, in fact, about wealth, ignores environmental services from soils, oceans and forests, and says nothing about energy flow. The idea that GDP growth is central to the measurement of the success of an economy is, in the words of one of the authors of the 1972 Limits to Growth report, one of the stupidest purposes ever invented by any culture. And yet it persists, and Scotland's economic policy will be deemed a success if, for example, the oil and gas sector continues to extract more hydrocarbons, despite the imperative to leave the vast majority of known reserves in the ground. Now, the economy of Scotland, like... I will. Uh, who are you taking, Mr. Whiteman? Oh, sorry, Mr. <laughs> Arthur. I'm Tom Arthur. Yes. I'm very grateful to Mr. Whiteman for giving way. I just wonder, notwithstanding the points he makes, many of which I'm sympathetic to, if you would concede that there is a correlation between per capita GDP, GDP and human well-being. Andy uh, Whiteman. There certainly is an indication that there's that correlation, but it's not the it's not the basis on which we need to build a sustainable economy because that correlation is not absolute. 
Now, the economy of Scotland, like the wider UK economy, is still too heavily weighted in favour of financial services, dangerously dependent on consumption, which continues to be fuelled by high levels of household debt, with a generation of young people facing excessive housing costs, job insecurity and lower living standards. Today, the Institute of Public Policy Research published the final report of its Commission on Economic Justice. It contains some of the ingredients for a successful uh, economy, and I would welcome the government's response to the recommendations for Scotland. Green politics is based on the four pillars of equality, peace, environmental sustainability, and radical democracy. And in our view, to secure the changes the economy and society need, people need the power to make those changes. Across Europe, cities and municipalities are leading the way in sustainable transport, clean air, affordable housing, and tackling climate change. They do so, by and large, because they have the legislative and the fiscal power to do so. They are drivers of economic activity, innovation, and sustainable futures. And that's why it is so disappointing to see the programme for government perpetuate an unambitious agenda to reform the way Scotland is governed at a local level, to provide a more local and participative local democracy with a commensurate fiscal powers to create genuine local autonomy. Quarter of a page out of 118 on the local government's review with no ambition or ideas about how Scotland can become a normal European country in respect to how we're governed locally. Modest proposals for a tourist tax commonplace across Europe kicked further down the road, although welcome confirmation from Kate Forbes this morning that such powers will be considered as part of budget negotiations. Presiding officer, a critical part of economic policy is taxation and the programme makes reference to them on page 61. And given the second highest yielding tax in Scotland is non-domestic rates, we welcome the proposal for a bill uh, on this matter. However, the thorough and comprehensive review of the whole business rate system promised by Derek Mackay as far back as 2013 was never delivered. Instead, we had the Barclay Review, which asked one question and was told to make its recommendations revenue neutral. That meant in practice that any proposals that were made to reduce liabilities in any sector had to be balanced by measures that would make up for the lost yield, and that's why we have some of the proposals to raise liabilities in those other sectors. This is not the way to do tax reform. Presiding officer, earlier this week we lost the Nobel Prize winner, Professor James Mirrlees. He was one of the Scottish Government's economic advisors. And in his Mirrlees review of 2011, a comprehensive look at the tax system, he said, amongst other things, that, and I quote, the business rate is not a good tax. Taxing non-domestic property is inefficient and should not be part of the tax system. The economic case for taxing land itself is very strong, he said, however. And on stamp duty, he said there is no sound case for maintaining stamp duty and we believe it should be abolished. Presiding officer, the government might ignore these wise words from one of its own advisors, but Greens won't. And we look forward to working across the chamber to secure the changes to some of the changes that he advocated uh, to uh, fiscal policy. And we also look forward to working with the government and with other parties to take forward some of the very good ideas in the programme for government. Thank you. Call Liam MacArthur to be followed by John Mason. Thank you. It was interesting, Deputy First Minister, uh, listening to the First Minister deliver her statement yesterday, uh, partly, and I'll come to this in a minute, in terms of what she had to say, but also because of the way it seemed to be received on her own backbenches. Those of us who've been in this parliament over the last 11 years have got used to the raucous adulation that normally greets such first ministerial set pieces. The uh, also spontaneous rounds of applause in response to carefully crafted clap lines. The pantomime of booing of those deemed unworthy of the people of Scotland. Not so yesterday. It was all rather muted, all a bit low key, all something of an anticlimax. That's not to say, that's not so. It's all behind me. That's not to say, of course, that there weren't positives in what uh, the First Minister had to say. Things I warmly welcome. Guaranteeing the voting rights of EU citizens in this country was an early and obvious example. So too confirmation that the principles of the UNCRC are to be incorporated into Scots law. I was on the Education Committee uh, in the last session when the government used its parliamentary uh, majority to fr frustrate any attempts of moving in that uh, direction during consideration of the Children and Young People's Act. But this rethink by the First Minister is nevertheless welcome, it's significant and it's potentially far-reaching. 
The same description applies to the additional funding announced yesterday for mental health, coming on the same day as figures showing the staggering scale of how far we currently are from meeting the needs of those of all ages, but particularly of children and young people suffering from poor mental health, only serve to underscore how vital that long overdue investment is. It must now prompt a substantial increase in training of specialist practitioners, just expecting teaching profession to pick up the pieces won't do, and ensuring improvements in provision uh, are felt across the whole country, including in rural and island areas, will also be essential. But, as I say, the, fund, the, the funding announced yesterday lays a good platform and must now pave the way for treatment of mental ill health uh, to be put on the same statutory footing as physical ill health. So positives, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and what Nicola Sturgeon had to say yesterday, but sadly, too few in a statement that went on for 40 minutes or more. Not that I was desperate uh, to hear her going on any longer, but I was struck by some of the bills that were conspicuous by their absence. The Good Food Nation bill appears to have uh, been boiled down to a mere programme. Richard Lockhead may be back in flavour of the month with the First Minister, but the bill he spent so much time evangelising has been dumped in the compost bin. With major challenges in food poverty, child obesity and even biodiversity loss, it's hard to understand why the government has scaled back its ambitions in this area. No sign either of the much-needed crofting reform bill to address growing frustration and anger at current regulation that is not fit for purpose and is actually holding back individuals, businesses and communities, including in places like Orkney. Missing in action too was any mechanism for undoing the mess the government has got itself into uh, in dismantling the British Transport Police. These are just some of the examples of where the First Minister's programme for government fell short and represents a missed opportunity. We did though get some signs as to what we might expect from the government's forthcoming budget bill, uh, though we'll have to wait a bit longer for the full reveal. For now, in the remaining time available, let me uh, gently remind the Finance Secretary of other commitments he has made and that will also need to be accommodated when that bill is brought forward. Much was made yesterday of plans for investment in infrastructure, re repeated again by Mr Mackay, yet it was difficult to identify much of direct relevance to more rural and island areas. Last year, of course, the Scottish Government finally agreed to begin honouring the promises it had made uh, through successive transport ministers, including Mr Mackay himself, on funding for Orkney and Shetland's internal ferry services. That principle has now been accepted. There cannot be any rowing back, and any attempt to do so would be seen by those in Orkney and Shetland as an act of betrayal on the part of this government. I'll take a brief intervention. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, will the member uh, agree with me that uh, a huge majority of the 600 million that will be invested in the reaching 100% coverage broadband programme is directed at rural areas? I will be a personal beneficiary. I'm looking forward to it. Liam MacArthur. I absolutely agree, although I, I think there are serious questions about the deliverability in, in parts of my constituency, and I, I appreciate the engagement there has been through the Digital Scotland team in, in trying to answer those questions, but questions and serious questions still remain. Um, so the principle has been accepted. At the same time, however, there was a recognition that the current arrangement for running those ferry services is not sustainable. I was pleased uh, that the Finance Secretary accepted at the same time the need for urgent action on a, ur a longer-term solution. In Orkney, this means replacement vessels. The current fleet is no longer up to the standards of operating many of these routes. The boats cost more to run, more to fix and more to keep at sea. Delays in replacing them is increasingly a false economy, one that comes at a cost to the communities that rely so heavily upon them. The new Transport Secretary must now get round the table as a matter of urgency with the local council and agree a programme for fleet replacement. This is being done on the West Coast, where we see multi-million pound vessels at least being procured, even if the building and delivery is not necessarily going according to plan. The recent passing of the Islands Act is not job done. Communities like the ones I represent expect this to be backed by action, including action on infrastructure investment, such as our lifeline at ferry services. In passing, I would also urge the government to sort out the mess over road equivalent tariff for Northern Isles ferry routes. I appreciate the dispute with Pentland Ferries is not entirely of their making, but the deafening silence from ministers over the summer is not encouraging. Those travelling between Orkney and Shetland in the Scottish mainland are still being forced to pay over the odds for using these services. That, Deputy Presiding Officer, cannot be allowed to continue. Thank you. We'll have to be a wee bit stricter with time from now on. So John Mason followed by Liam Kerr. 
Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very happy to be speaking in this debate at the start of the new parliamentary year. Can I just say to Liam MacArthur that some of us do not do raucous adulation at all? Um, <laughs> I, I, I have to say that I think uh, this programme for government uh, looks very positive to me and it seems to me that it is building on last year's plans. Last year, one bill I was heavily involved in was the Islands Bill and I think some opposition members have suggested that we could uh, push through more bills or we could push through bills faster um, and perhaps the present system is too slow. But I think when we look at that bill, uh, the government did a lot of work in preparation for it the REC committee, which I'm a member of, spent a huge amount of time, eh, both here and out visiting on the islands, eh, to take that through. We did some of that during recess, eh, and we also had a lot of good input from all six councils that were involved. So I have to say, I would be very reluctant for us as a parliament to churn such bills through faster and end up with some more kind of slapdash approach, such as they have at Westminster. Now, I'm particularly interested in the economy being a eh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Bruce Crawford. I wonder if the member would remember during the period from 2011 when the SNP were majority government, the number of times opposition complained about the amount of legislation it was pushing through Parliament when it could. John Mason. Yeah, yes, that's a fair point. And uh, clearly the, op the opposition say one thing one day and another thing another day. Now, I'm particularly interested in the economic side of things. And uh, the idea that there's going to be more focus on infrastructure strikes me as extremely good. That can mean more jobs. And just yesterday, the Economy Committee, for example, eh, we were hearing that GVA in the construction sector was £52,900 eh, per head in 2016, which is higher than for many other sectors. So that is a good place to be investing in. At the same time, I think we have to accept that there has been a tradition for construction jobs to go to men. And so we do need to continue challenging such gender stereotypes and break down some of these traditional barriers in society. As yet, we have not seen the detail of how all this extra money will be allocated. So as others probably put their bids in, as co-convener of the Rail Cross Party Group, eh, I would just like to say that I would be very happy to see more money spent on rail. For example, the Perth Inverness eh, line is an opportunity and also a challenge. Dueling the A9 is absolutely great and fabulous, but a side effect could be putting rail travel at a disadvantage. And so hopefully that might be one of the kind of areas that the Cabinet Secretary would look at. Now, thinking about the economy, eh, we also think about what the other two main parties eh, look at and the way they, they view the economy. First of all, we have the Conservatives. Now, they would like us to think that they are the realistic party. They realise that we have to live within our means. Uh, expenditure, expenditure can outstrip income year after year, and they want to see growth and an increase in productivity. Now, many of these things I can agree with. But there is a problem with the Conservative vision for the economy. They do not seem to care how the growth comes about, and they do not seem to care who suffers in the process, as long as the economy grows. So if the rich get super rich and the poor get super poor, that would still be success in the Conservative world, as long as the economy is growing. Then, on the other hand, we have Labour. They do not do realism. Richard Leonard and Jeremy Corbyn are probably well-meaning people in a bumbling sort of way. They would just say that we should spend more and more and more. They do not really have a plan as to where that money would come from. Eh, perhaps they'll start a new tax tomorrow or raise an old one. But why bother planning about these things? Eh, no, I don't think so, from Mr. Finlay. Yes, absolutely. Eh. <laughs> or perhaps we could just borrow and borrow and borrow and hopefully one day eh, someone will repay it. Now, in contrast to these two flawed models, we have a party of government, the SNP, whom the people of Scotland clearly trust because we have been here for 11 years. Now, it is a challenge to be in government and to be forced to be realistic, but also aspirational at the same time. It seems to me that this programme for government strikes a good balance between being more progressive than the UK has been, raising income taxes a bit more, investing for the future, but at the same time being realistic about what we can borrow and afford to pay back in the future. Now, clearly, Brexit is a huge aspect of any programme for the coming year, and it has been mentioned by a number of speakers. I think many of the public and many of us are getting fed up with the endless bickering at Westminster and the myriad of potential scenarios. And perhaps our Conservative colleagues could tell their London masters that it is about time we had some definite plans and actions 
and not just contradictions, claims and counterclaims. One of the Conservatives' favourite lines seems to be that Scotland does more trade with the UK than with the EU, uh, perhaps 61% uh, for the UK, 17% or thereabouts with the EU, uh, and that is well and good, that is true. But the idea from the Conservatives that we can just forget about that 17% and presumably take a 17% hit on our economy uh, is absolute madness. Scotland cannot afford to lose either of these important markets, the EU or the UK. Our farmers, our fishing boats, our business people need both. We need both the UK market and the EU market. So would the Conservatives please put the country's interest ahead of their narrow party squabbles? Uh, on population and immigration, uh, it was Jack McConnell, I think, who really led in a lot of this, that we cannot grow the economy if we are not allowed to have a growing population. And uh, that is absolutely key if we want to have, uh, grow our internal markets, grow our taxpayer base and grow our workforce. On the budget, could I just say that I hope this is an opportunity for the opposition parties to think about whether they will constructively engage in the budget, uh, whether they will sit down and seek to reach a compromise. This is a minority government in a parliament with proportional representation. We all need to compromise. No one will get exactly what they want. And I would appeal to both Labour and the Tories uh, to think a bit more seriously than they have in previous years. Thank you. That's fine, Mr Mason. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Now, I've not had the chance to formally welcome the new Cabinet Secretary for Justice to his role yet, and I'm pleased to do so, both in general and in the context of the programme for government. Some may consider his inheritance as something of a poison chalice, with violent crime up, dr drug crime up, robbery up, detection rate down, and that in a context of police officer numbers, which have been cut to a nine-year low. It would be a big ask for anyone to pick it up cold, let alone someone from a completely separate brief, which is why I want to reiterate Ruth Davidson's point yesterday and encourage the new Justice Department to work with those who do have that experience and the policies. The early signs are promising, unlike his predecessor who in the face of repeated criticism from the Scottish Conservatives, the train operating companies, the trade unions, most other op opposition parties and the public railroaded through the unwanted, unnecessary and dangerous BTP merger, but the new Cabinet Secretary has climbed down. Although oddly, railway policing is not mentioned at all in the programme for government. The programme for government also makes an unequivocal, unambiguous promise to introduce Finns law. Clearly the Finns law campaigners, a petition with 40,000 signatures, the correspondence from the kids at Mosnuk Primary School, a member's business motion with cross-party support and my demands on Monday that it be included in the programme for government worked. Then there is restorative justice. In this debate last year, I said that the government should introduce a genuine programme of restorative justice to tip the balance back in favour of victims who too often experience a justice system that offers them nothing. Indeed, I led a member's debate on it around six months ago. The result? A commitment to publish a restorative ju justice action plan by spring 2019. Good. We demanded a commitment to crack down on drug driving, and I welcomed last year's programme for government, which promised to implement this one. Unfortunately, the SNP are still yet to lay the statutory instrument to get it done, but at least, like many other aspects of last year's programme, the commitment has been reheated, which is welcome. But there is much in the justice brief which is less encouraging. I noted the Cabinet Secretary's recent statement in a magazine that victims' rights will be strengthened. Well, the programme for government doesn't do it because the measures for victims announced fall far short of what is required. Bluntly, it offers to ensure victims and their families have better information and greater support ahead of prison release arrangements. But there is no commitment to give victims and families any meaningful input. Victims and their families have asked that their safety and welfare is explicitly required to be taken into account. They have asked for the increased use of exclusion zones on offenders and that the victim notification scheme is revised so they are given reasons for release and can make representations in person. That is meaningful input into a process that currently treats victims as little more than an afterthought. That is Michelle's law and that will form the subject of my members' debate tomorrow to which I very much look forward. Two final points. Yet again, the ill-thought-through extension to the presumption against custodial sentences from three to 12 months has reared its head. Look, I understand the SNP want to save money by emptying our prisons. 
but compromising the safety of the people of Scotland by allowing serious criminals out onto the streets is not the solution. Last year, 10,000 offenders were sentenced to 12 months or less in prison. That figure includes two convicted of homicide, 99 of serious assault or attempted murder, and 60 of robbery. This plan will let some of the most dangerous criminals back out into society and make life even more miserable for victims of crime across Scotland, of course. Cabinet Secretary. There, uh, giving way. His UK government colleague, the Minister for State for Prisons, uh, Rory Stewart MP, said uh, just yesterday, it is of course true that we have evidence that shows clearly there is a higher incidence of reoffending from people in short prison sentences than from people who serve community sentences. That is why the example from the Government of Scotland is very relevant. Is he also similarly criti critical of his UK government coming to a part? Liam Kerr. President Officer, isn't it interesting how the SNP are so focused on what's happening in England and Wales. It's almost as if, it is almost as if they don't know we have a separate justice system. I'm interested in Scotland's justice system and from the evidence we have, it is clear that the SNP's community sentence model as currently constructed is not working. And the cabinet secretary also brought up Rory Stewart. I'll take this opportunity to remind him, Rory Stewart also said, if I haven't sorted out the prisons within a year, I will resign. I look forward to a similar promise coming from this cabinet secretary. Presiding officer, finally prisoner voting. I note that the reference to consulting on this is buried in two separate pages out of 118 comprising eight words each. Now I'm not surprised that the SNP is a bit embarrassed about giving this any profile. The SNP has been criticised for being too distracted by its own troubles to deal with the things that really make a difference to communities. Well, here is a great example of exactly that. A consultation about a reform which is unworkable, unwanted and not morally justified. A consultation which is a waste of time because when prisoners are sent to prison, they surrender their right to choose the government and a consultation which is little more than an insult to victims and their families. The SNP needs to get back to the day job and start putting victims and communities first. And I look forward to helping the Cabinet Secretary retain that focus. Thank you. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to be followed by James Kelly. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in and welcome today's debate on the programme for government and I absolutely endorse the programme set out yesterday by the First Minister and today I'd like to focus my comments on two key aspects of the programme, one health and one economy related. The first is the announcement of the additional £250 million for mental health investment. This investment will deliver 350 dedicated counsellors in schools and an additional 250 school nurses and it will also fund an additional 80 counsellors to work in further and higher education, as well as there will be extra funding for teachers. This objective of the investment is to provide our young people and their families with a high standard of emotional and mental health support, guidance and advice, which will enable them to effectively and efficiently proceed with their education. I'm focusing on the, mission, the issue of mental health, firstly, as a nurse and a former clinical educator, but also as a member of the Health and Sport Committee and as new convener of the cross-party group of mental health, along with colleagues James Dornan and Annie Wells. I'm extremely proud to support a government which has not only taken the issue of mental health seriously, but which is the first government in the UK to have a dedicated mental health minister. And I wish Claire Hawkey well in her new role. Additionally, I look forward to seeing the outcome of scrutinising progress of the implementation of the programme. Just before recess, I sponsored a Scottish Eating Disorder Interest Group reception here in Parliament. And we heard many inspiring stories from experts, parents and most important, those living with an eating disorder. And one of the key messages from those attending the SEDIC event was that it's key to receive diagnosis and treatment early so that the most effective management and recovery can occur. So I would like to ask the Scottish Government to consider supporting, including an approach to addressing eating disorders for the young people who may be experiencing a disorder which might negatively be affecting their health, including diabulimia. 
The second point I'd like to focus on specifically relates to my South Scotland region, and that is the creation of the South Scotland Economic Partnership, led by Professor Russell Griggs, ahead of the legislation announcement yesterday by the First Minister to create a South Scotland Enterprise Agency. The South Scotland Economic Partnership has been operational over the past 12 months, and the board members have been holding engagement meetings across South Scotland, and there has been strong engagement and interest. The development and ultimate sustainability of the economy and indeed economic development of the South region, as I am pleased to report that these meetings have been well received with predominantly positive feedback from the people attending. Whilst the South Scotland Enterprise Agency is absolutely crucial to support investment to the South's economy, we must also recognise that digital, road and rail infrastructure is also key to attracting business, tourism and people to the South. That's why I'm happy that in the programme for government there is a commitment to improving infrastructure of the South of Scotland. This includes commitment to carrying out and implementing major infrastructure projects across the region. This includes the Mabel Bypass and broadband and also published in the South Scotland Strategic Roads and Rail Review. I look forward to this review, which is currently underway, and I, it will identify, hopefully, infrastructure projects that are required across the South region and inform the projects going forward. I will continue to lobby the government for investment on the A75, 76 and 77 with my colleagues Jean Freeman and Joan McAlpine and I look forward to future announcements regarding these major arterial routes which are necessary for business, tourism and daily travel. I'd like also um, just to make one final point. Whilst attending the agricultural and cattle shows over recess, I took the baby box on tour. The chance for folks to look inside and get in about the contents proved worthwhile. There were many positive comments. And in the southwest of Scotland, apparently there's been about 4,000 baby boxes that have been delivered already, which means there's been about 4,000 babies being delivered as well. So the feedback I have received indicated that the baby box has been significantly helping parents, allowing the parents to focus their finances on other necessary products. So, presiding officer, while the UK government continues their Burich Brexit bungling, or in John Mason's words, bumbling, I support the Scottish government, which is getting on with the day job by delivering and indeed standing up for the people of Scotland. And I know my time is, I'm done actually, so you've got a wee bit of time in hand. So, thank you very much. A very kind of you, Miss Harper. I don't know whether I'll take you with me, but thank you very much. I call James Kelly to be followed by Colin Beaton. Mr Kelly, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, families throughout Scotland looking at the programme for government announcement yesterday and looking for uh, measures that would provide a much-needed boost to household income would have been sadly disappointed. Um, as Jackie Bailey pointed out, the economic outlook is a bleak one. The Fiscal Commission records that forecasts will not exceed 1% up until 2023. Um, you know, and it's, it's not just the actual figures, it's what that actually means uh, on the ground. The reality is that there are far too many people in the economy in Scotland uh, working in low paid jobs. We still have 467,000 people earning less than the living wage. Uh, that means if you're uh, working in a, a fast food restaurant in Rutherglen on the minimum wage of £7.38, you're only earning £258 a week. And what that means to, to some, as someone recounted to me earlier in the week, is that people are doing uh, three jobs in order to uh, you know, make up the, the, the gap in their household income. Uh, and as we move uh, forward, you know, as uh, fuel and food bills increase at a greater rate than inflation, but uh, wages struggle to keep pace with inflation, then as the Fiscal Commission points out, that household income will continue to be under pressure and that, that will have a, a, a potentially detrimental a, a, a effect on economic growth. Added to that, uh, we have had a sustained programme of SNP cuts to public services uh, and they have uh, also drained economic growth. 
If you take education as an example, since 2010, £400 million pounds has been cut from education. And that means there are less teachers, 3,500 less since 2007, and less uh, classroom assistance. And ultimately, that does impact on results. The recent uh, batch of results showed that for the third year in a row, hires, which are a key qualification to enter university, the pass rates had declined. Uh, not only that, but in some of the key subjects, not enough people have taken the subjects up. There have been serious declines, for example, in languages in French and German. I assume that, uh, you know, when Brexit uh, happens, we still want uh, people who are qualified in, co in foreign languages in order to be able to uh, interact with uh, companies abroad. And the fact that we don't have enough uh, students taking these subjects up and also have declines in the pass rate is something that's a real concern. At the other end, in terms of entrance into university, uh, there are restrictions in places for uh, home-based students. And that's, that's, that, that's resulted in a reduction in key areas. In medicine, for example, the uptake from Scottish students in the year 2000 was 63% of all places. And last year it was down to just over 50%. And that comes at a time when the chair of the BMA tells us this morning that the crisis in the NHS uh, is at a tipping point and we're not, tra we're not training the same number. Yes, yeah, sure. Cabinet Secretary. I know the opposition are perfectly entitled to give a critique of government performance and policy, and we could argue about it all day. But let's cheer the chamber up. Mr Kelly, what's the big idea, the big single policy idea coming from the Labour Party right now? James Kelly. The big idea is to stop the cuts. If you stop draining, <laughs> stop draining the £400 million from Scotland's education sector, because if you, if you continue to cut, Mr Mackay, as you've done repeatedly since 2011, and all the meek backbenchers have pressed their buttons voting, voting for those budgets, you take the resources out, as I've, as I've explained, as I've explained, the results, the results deteriorate and we don't have enough qualified doctors coming out and you end up with the BMA on the, on the radio this morning telling us that the NHS is at tipping point. So that's a direct result of your policies. Added to that, Mr Mackay, we've had real inaction from the SNP. You tinkered round the edges on tax powers, which you demanded for years and weren't able to use them effectively, doing nothing in terms of targeting top-rate taxpayers. And also when the outturn figures were reported, we found out you'd, you'd underspent the budget by £454 million, pounds, nearly half a billion pounds, stuck down Derek Mackay's sofa in St, Andrew, in St Andrew's house, rather than, rather than providing help to Scotland's public public services. In addition to that, not prepared to pass on some ne much needed assistance uh, to councils in terms of giving them support for, uh, for, for issues like, for issues like the, the tourist tax, uh, which, which would have raised a lot during, during the Edinburgh Festival. So in summing up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm delighted I'm I'm delighted I've cheered the chamber up a bit. We've got a bit of atmosphere going. I'm delighted to be cheered from those SNP benches, but on a serious note, what we need is we need a programme that stops the cuts. We need a proper economic and industrial strategy which has skills at, at its uh, priority, and we need to prioritise proper and well-paid jobs that's the, difference, the difference we need to make in order to move Scotland's economy forward. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. And I don't want to halt you in the middle, but please, I can remind members not to use the term you when referring to other members. I understand you were passionate there. I call Mr Beattie, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Colin Beattie, please. Presiding officer, firstly, let me congratulate the First Minister and our government for bringing forward the programme for government. 
A recent analysis of Scotland's economy make for very encouraging reading. Last month's quarterly national accounts showed an updated gross domestic product growth estimate of 0.4% for the first quarter in 2018, revised from June's estimate of 0.2%. And that compares very well against the equivalent growth rate figure for the whole of the UK, which stands at 0.2%. Output in both the services and production sectors grew in the first quarter by 0.4% and 1% respectively. The construction sector contracted by 1.4%, but we should remember that the weather, specifically the beast from the east, played a major role in this. When compared to the same quarter last year, the indications are that Scotland's GDP has grown by 1.3% in real terms, revised from a first estimate of 0.8%, and very comparable to the equivalent UK growth of 1.2%. And that evidence clearly displays that despite the global financial uncertainties affecting all economies, and after a decade of Westminster austerity measures that were supposed to cure the UK's financial ills but really have merely promoted poverty, poverty and hardships, the measures the Scottish Government are taking to protect and promote the Scottish economy are fundamentally the right ones. There should be no doubt that Scotland is a rich and successful country with many assets that other countries covet. We stand in the top 25 global economies in terms of income per head and rank behind only London and the southeast of England in terms of most long-term indicators. Our exports of goods have increased 12% over the past year, the fastest growth of any nation in the UK. For the latest EY attractiveness survey showed that Scotland remains the top UK region for foreign direct investment projects outside of London. However, despite this positive background, there are many challenges to be faced in the years to come. Unsurprisingly, foremost of this is Brexit. Our export success is directly threatened by the prospect of being removed from access to the single market and customs union which I'm sure I don't need to remind my fellow MSPs, is a market around eight times bigger than the UK market alone. As it stands, and including the European economic area, Scotland's exports to Europe accounted for over 52% of our exported goods in 2016. And a major part of these exports is oil and gas, by some margin our largest export. And it start, that stands at around 17% of total exports to the EU. And this sector, while it's seen its troubles in the past years, it's beginning to consolidate and recent analysis by the Oil and Gas Authority shows that production this year is expected to be 18% higher. Meanwhile, the latest Fraser of Allender oil and gas survey shows that net confidence of oil and gas contractors is at its highest level since spring 2013. Leaving the European Union without any kind of plan in place is almost certain to jeopardize the cautious growth and optimism that the oil and gas sector is reflecting. Given that oil represents less than 5% of total UK exports, it's unsurprising that the Conservatives have chosen not to emphasise this sector in the Brexit negotiations, despite its crucial importance to Scotland. If we were free to negotiate our own deals, we would have the opportunity to focus on what truly matters to our economy and not have to rely on others who do not care, who do not care to hear Scotland's voice. But perhaps that behaviour is to be expected from the Tories. Figures released on, in May under Freedom of Information showed that in my own constituency alone, Cuts to disability payments saw East Lothian losing out £1 million and Mid Lothian losing £1.1 million. The sum lost across Scotland's communities came to a staggering £56 million. For many local people and economies, this money is a lifeline, and to have taken it away not only displays a callous attitude towards the people of this country, but also a short sightedness in how to support communities from the ground up. At the same time, Labour cannot get away from accusations of short term thinking. The morally questionable endeavours known as private finance initiatives have had major financial impacts on my constituencies. Midlothian Council is now spending 11%, over £10 million, of its annual school budget servicing PFI debts left by the Labour Party a decade ago. East Lothian Council is spending a similar percentage of its school budget, equating to around £8.9 million in PFI debts. And in 2016-17 across Scotland, total PFI repayments cost Scotland over a billion pounds. Now that contrasts with the Scottish Government's investing in our local communities. For example, since 2009, the Schools for the Future programme has invested £9.5 million in East Lothian schools and £50.8 million in schools in Mid Lothian. Another initiative announced as part of the programme for Scotland is the launch of the National Investment Bank. The programme for government outlined how we'll set aside resources of £340 million to fund the bank in the first instance. And as, I'll put a plug in here. As convener of the Cross-Party Group on Industrial Communities, I'm pleased to say that this evening's meeting will feature a guest speaker from the Scottish Government who will speak on this topic. The programme for Scotland outlined 
a wide range of other measures to promote and enhance our economy. For example, the Government will provide £96 million of extra support to deliver the most attractive business package rates in the UK, with the increase to the rates poundage capped at CPI rather than RPI inflation. The issue of housing is one that many local economies depend on, and the Government will establish a £150 million Building Scotland Fund to unlock new house building, develop new carbon commercial low-carbon commercial property, and support research and development. And transport is another sector that strongly ties into the economy, and the Government will invest £60 million in the Low Carbon Innovation Fund to deliver innovative low-carbon energy infrastructure solutions, including electric vehicles, while also investing £1.2 billion in the transport infrastructure. Presiding Officer, I hope it's clear that from all we've heard from the First Minister and the Scottish Government over the last day or so, that Scotland's in safe hands. The Tories willingly choose to ignore investment or support local communities, while Labour simply cannot be trusted to get the sums right without landing a future government with unsustainable levels of debt. I look forward to the implementation of this programme for Scotland. Thank you. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the cultural and tourism elements of the programme for government today. And on a cordial note, I'm pleased to see that the Scottish Government recognise the importance of tourism and culture as a force for good. There are several aspects of the programme for government which are positive news for the tourism sector. And I was pleased to have received reassurance from Fiona Hislop that the so-called tourism tax has been ditched. And on the 22nd of June, I received a letter confirming that Scottish ministers are not willing to consider requests to explore a possible tourism levy unless the tourism and hospitality industry are involved from the outset and their long-term interests are fully recognised. But that seems to be at, uh, at odds with what Kate Forbes said earlier. Uh, I also welcome um, the fact that there's um, incentivisation uh, to promote agri-tourism, which um, will help working with farms, estates and offices to develop uh, food tourism. Presiding officer, we all know that every one pound spe spent on culture and tourism generates between an extra four and six pounds for the economy. And the tourism industry accounts for one jobs in 12. It's described as the cornerstone of the Scottish economy. It's vital to the economic performance across Scotland's towns, cities and regions. And the Tourism Scotland 2020 uh, strategy centres on influencing investment in the sector and supporting infrastructure and on improving the quality of visitor experience across Scotland. And that's what I really want to concentrate on today. So it's really a no-brainer that investment in culture and heritage sectors boost the economy, tourism and employment, often in areas where these three factors would struggle to perform well. The potential in Scotland for tourism, as we know, is colossal. The exciting and diverse range of attractions which our country has to offer makes it a unique destination, not only for domestic travellers, but also to international visitors. However, I feel that this SNP government simply hasn't grasped the nettle when it comes to maximising Scotland's potential, helping out communities with necessarily necessary additional infrastructure. And how far will the six million that was set aside uh, last year for the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund really go to alleviate the worries of local communities? Take, for example, the world famous uh, NC500 route, a breathtaking drive through some of Scotland's most awe-inspiring and dramatic natural landscapes. The fact that remains that the roads along the north coast are narrow, they're bumpy, they're dangerous, motorbikes and fast cars treat the roads like scale electrics tracks. Why wasn't it mentioned in the programme for government? Where is the Scottish government support for local communities who are crying out for this type of investment? I will take an intervention. Cabinet Secretary. It, it sounds as if uh, the members build into a crescendo of demanding more funds for investment in this particular sector. I understand those appeals, but how does that then match with the only thing that the Conservatives have raised in the Scottish Parliament, which is tax cuts for the richest and tax relief for independent schools? Rachel Hamilton. Well, thank Derek Mackay for that intervention. I don't know if you uh, remembered that we had a, a debate which was called uh, the Scottish Conservatives were suggesting hundred million pound pothole fund, and also you did find ten million. You, you did well. It was in our manifesto that in 2016, which was costed. So um, you also, uh, Derek Mackay, promised uh, ten million, gave ten million to local authorities uh, to assist with the road maintenance following the beast from the east. So I'm sure you can find something down the back of your sofa again. Another example... Ms Hamilton, you might find something down the back of his sofa, but please stop using the term you. Okay. I've already I apologise, presiding officer. 
Another example is the Glenfinnan Viaduct, and this beautiful viaduct used time and time again in film and TV cannot cope with extra visitors due to the lack of car parking capacity. Tourists turning away from visiting as a result of a lack of infrastructure. Historic Environment Scotland own many of Scotland's most famous landmarks and are launching a Robert the Bruce trail to capitalise on the release of Outlaw King. It's all very well applauding the success of tourism, but the Scottish Government need to commit supporting the sector too. Rural and remote areas are struggling to cope with this demand, which in turn is discouraging tourists from visiting these busy areas. And we don't want that. No one in this chamber wants that. So I'm calling on the Scottish Government to be ambitious, to have an honest and frank conversation with communities and tourist areas, or communities that benefit from tourism areas, to ensure that they all have the necessary tools to, to ensure that we can take advantage of that tourism potential. And, and that's what I just want to reiterate, that this programme for government fundamentally misses the lack of sufficient infrastructure that is required and shows a lack of consideration for rural areas. Moving on to uh, the culture aspect, the programme for government uh, wants a vision for culture that is inclusive. And whilst I'm pleased that the Scottish Government continue to allow free access to Scotland's museums and, and galleries, I cannot help notice that there's no mention of inclusion for those with, for example, uh, mental health or, or dementia, for example. We need to work constructively to ensure that cultural experiences and events are accessible and appropriate for everyone. And this programme rehashes old announcements and commitments which offer little for new attractions. It's the same but in a different order as last year. It's the same regurgitated, boring old stuff. But whilst perhaps vital other projects are missing out on new funding, such as concerts, venues, galleries, theatres, that could promote inclusive tourism, like the way that Capital Theatres, for example, have done. Presiding officer, I, like many other colleagues, are looking forward to the opening of the V&A Museum and it will bring many people to Dundee. It's a fantastic example of where the UK and Scottish governments can pool resources and work together. I also just want to, I know my, I'm conscious of my time, I just want to um, make the point that the Scottish Government are responding to what's going on now, which is the Royal Conservatoire Review, especially in the year of young people, but it's important that we take a serious look at the provision of music education so it remains accessible to all. And in conclusion, presiding officer, whilst there are some announcements in this programme which encourage cult cultural participation and boost tourism, the bottom line is this SNP Government is tired and running out of steam, and I'm, frankly, I was really disappointed. Thank you very much. I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the programme for government and today's focus on the economy, in particular the commitment to increase annual infrastructure investment by £7 billion for hospitals, schools, housing and a range of other investment projects, which is particularly important for Edinburgh. Edinburgh is one of the economic hotspots of the UK with many of the largest companies in Scotland having a presence in the city. Just two sectors highlight the success of Edinburgh's booming economy. The financial se services sector has grown by 46% over the last five years, and the demand for staff in Edinburgh and Glasgow has resulted in Scotland being the best area of the UK for graduate pay. New company starts, startups in Scotland are growing at a faster rate than the rest of the UK and is double what it was in 2000. In Edinburgh, the new business startup five year survival rate is higher in Edinburgh than any other UK city, including London, Manchester, and Liverpool. Tourism is booming in Edinburgh with record number of visitors coming to the city last year, and this year is heading again for record levels. The result is that hotel occupancy rates are higher than most other major European cities. In order to support the growing economy in Edinburgh, we need people. And over the last 10 years, the city has had the highest growth in the number of households among Scottish cities. The 12% increase in population over that period equates to 100 new residents on average a week, every week. The council is pulling out all the stops to address the housing need. And this month, we'll see the letting of new affordable homes at Fernie Flat, Nuke and the Calders area of my constituency and North Sight Hill later this year. There is no doubt we still need more affordable homes and therefore this increased infrastructure expenditure will support the Council to deliver its ambitious programme to build at least 10,000 social and affordable homes over the next five years with a plan to build 20,000 by 2027. Alongside the new homes being built, we need superfast broadband that allows households to watch television, shop online or pay their bills. 
Unfortunately, in the semi-rural parts of my constituency, this connectivity has been poor. However, the announcement that reaching 100% contract will be awarded in the coming year will mean that this issue of poor connectivity that concerns some of my constituents will be addressed so that every business and residential property in Scotland will have access to superfast broadband. The families attracted to Edinburgh to take advantage of the work opportunities need good quality educational facilities. Across Scotland, schools that are good or satisfactory have improved from 61% in 2007 to 86% in 2017. Parents in my constituency are looking forward to the next round of funding for the Schools for the Future programme as a number of high schools in my constituency were built in the 1970s and are now in need of refurbishment. We also have to protect the character of Edinburgh and the investment in our railway network, currently underway especially on the Glasgow-Edinburgh via Shorts line, will allow people to commute from further afield where housing costs are substantially cheaper. My constituents who use Curry Hill, Wester Hills, Kingsnow or Slateford railway stations will always also benefit from the investment in our railways due to the new Class 385 rolling stock being introduced in the coming months, the most modern trains in the UK. It is not just the investment in railways that is helping the Scottish Government tackle congestion and air quality issues in Edinburgh, but also the investment in other areas of public transport. The Scottish Green Bus Fund has already supported investment by Lothian Buses in purchasing 65 low-carbon vehicles, part of a package that invested £16 million towards 360 low-carbon buses into the Scottish bus fleet. The eighth round of the Scottish Green Bus Fund will see a further investment of £1.7 million that will add over 100 green buses to the fleet, helping to achieve the 50% reduction contained in the Climate Change Plan by 2032. Presiding officer, my constituency is also home to Dreghorn Barracks and Redford Cavalry and Infantry Barracks. Therefore, I welcome the announcement that the Veterans Commissioner's recommendations will be implemented. These include providing support for those individuals transitioning from the military to find fulfilling civilian careers and to develop an approach that meets the healthcare needs of veterans. I also welcome the support that will help veterans and military spouses who want to run their own businesses find space to develop their business ideas at new workspace hubs that will be located near main defence bases. This year's programme for government is titled Delivering for Today, Investing for Tomorrow. And for my constituents in Edinburgh Pentlands, that is exactly what this government is doing. Thank you very much. I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Lockhart, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Just before recess, the Economy Committee published a wide-ranging report on the performance of the Scottish economy over the past 10 years. The inquiry lasted six months, and the committee heard evidence from stakeholders across all sectors. The main conclusions of the report include the following, and I quote, Economic growth in Scotland in the past decade has been significantly below the performance of the UK economy and Scottish Government targets, as well as historical growth rates for Scotland. I will in a second. The report goes on to conclude that levels of GDP growth in Scotland are marginal, productivity is low and wages are stagnant. These conclusions are supported by what the Scottish Government's own figures tell us about what's happening in the economy. We're seeing the lowest trends in economic growth in Scotland for 60 years. And perhaps now the Cabinet Secretary can explain why that is the case. Cabinet Secretary. Hey, that isn't the case. And I think that's the point that I was just about to make, that since publication of that report, and looking at, say, specifically GDP, Scotland is outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. I have read the Economy Committee's report, and I'm sure that Dean Lockhart will welcome this. I will try and implement as much as I possibly can from that very fair report in terms of recommendations. But equally, will Dean Lockhart welcome the fact that Scotland's economy is now performing the rest of the UK. Mr uh, well, Lockhart. I would welcome any good news on the Scottish economy because it's such a rare event. And what I would say to the Cabinet Secretary is read page 14 of the economy report. It shows that for the last uh, 11 years that his uh, party has been in power, 
the Scottish economy has lagged behind the UK for nine of those 11 years. That's the economic reality. And every leading forecaster between now and the next Holyrood election is forecasting for the Scottish economy to continue to underperform the rest of the UK. That is the economic reality that the Cabinet Secretary has to realise. Also, wages are falling across the economy. Productivity levels continue to decline. Record numbers of shops are closing on high streets across Scotland. And we've heard the latest GERS numbers show the highest ever gap in the public finances between Scotland and the rest of the UK, resulting in a record union dividend of over £1,800 per person. Presiding officer, given this unprecedented economic background, the main recommendation of the, economic, uh, the Economy Committee, supported by all members, was for the Scottish Government's economic strategy to be reviewed and updated as a matter of urgency. This programme for Government was the ideal opportunity for the SNP to do that, to move away from the failed economic agenda of the last 11 years and to set out a new vision for the Scottish economy. But the programme for Government fails at every level. First of all, there is no new vision. I need to make a bit of progress. I don't have a lot of time. I might later. There is no new vision. All of the economic measures in the programme of, of government have practically been announced before. There is nothing new in the South of Scotland Enterprise Board, the Barclay Review, the tinkering with business rates, the establishment of trade desks sitting within British embassies, and the Scottish National Investment Bank has already been debated in this chamber. Yeah. Now, the programme for government, the programme for government does set out two new economic measures, but they lack credibility. First, the National Export Plan to help increase Scotland's exports across the world has funding support of less than £7 million a year. To put that into context, there's an announcement today of £30 million for staffing for the Scottish National Investment Bank. This shows how real the ambitions of the SPs are for growing Scotland's exports. And secondly, perhaps this is what Mr Mackay wants to talk about, the new Economic Action Plan announced as a central part of the programme for government Another yesterday. One. But when you look closer, it is yeah, hidden yeah. in the programme on page 46 as a footnote. All this shows is this, again, is an exercise in spin and no substance from the SNP. But the most fundamental problem with this programme for government is that people no longer trust the SNP to run the economy. The people of Scotland have seen promise after promise being broken by the SNP when it comes to the economy. In the programme for government in 2016, the First Minister announced the Scottish Growth Scheme as a half billion pounds vote of confidence in business. But more than two years later, not a single loan has been granted to Scottish business under that scheme. In the 2016 Holyrood Manifesto, the SNP promised not to increase the basic rate of income tax. We now have more than one million people in Scotland paying more as a result of that broken promise. Yesterday, the First Minister promised that the business environment in Scotland will remain competitive, but the SNP continues to punish business by imposing the large business supplement. And the SNP has promised to increase productivity to the first quartile, but again, figures released just two weeks ago show that we are still in the third division. The list of SNP broken promises on the economy is endless, but this shouldn't surprise us because in the final analysis, the SNP will always prioritize independence above everything else, above the economy, above the NHS, and above the education. No, I, I'm running out of time. It was the first minister, I'll remind the cabinet secretary, it was the First Minister herself who made it clear, and I quote, independence transcends the issues of national wealth, oil, and balance sheets. It could not be clearer what the priority is. Presiding officer, the people of Scotland want real change. They want an end to constitutional politics and a government focused on the day job. This program for government is not the answer. It is now clearer than ever, this is a tired government out of new ideas, out of its depth, and running out of time. Thank you very much, Mr Locker. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Michael Madison. Mr yeah, Finlay, thanks, please. Officer, the, the economy doesn't sit separate from public services. Over the summer, I met with and dealt with constituents who want and need real change, constituents who are struggling to get by and who feel powerless in their daily lives, who don't see an economy or society working for them, constituents like those families in Livingston who cannot access the children's ward at their local hospital, they want a fully funded NHS. Or like those in Seafield whose countryside is threatened by a housing development outside the development plan, they want equal rights in the planning system. 
or families in Livingston, Adiwell, Bridge End, Dedridge, Dechman and Stonyburn who are isolated because First Bus withdrew their bus services. They want a bus that takes them to work and keeps them in a job. Or the businesses and workers who have real and genuine, genuine concerns about their jobs and futures in post-Brexit Britain. They want reassurances and confidence that they can plan the way forward. Or the people in East Calder and Mid Calder who want a new health, health, health centre. Or Mid Lothian who cannot access a GP. Or in Stonyburn who've lost their GP service altogether. Families in Edinburgh who see so-called market failure in social care, leaving their loved ones stuck in hospital instead of being back in their own home. Or the parents and partners taken to the brink, seeing the people they love disappearing before their eyes into a black hole of despair because they cannot get help for their mental health condition. Or indeed, the family and friends of 1,000 people who have died this year from drugs. All of these people need health, social care, and a system of public services that supports them and ends their suffering. The public service failures go hand in hand with economic stagnation. People need real change and they need a government acting, indeed for the many, not the few. An economy and a system of social protection that is based on equality and justice. So let me say what Labour would do to address these issues. How we will deliver exactly that. We would introduce a budget to end the cuts and invest in public services with fair and progressive taxation. A planned industrial strategy delivering an economy based on high wages, skills, skilled jobs and a long-term plan for growth and full employment. A national investment bank not capitalised by 250 million but capitalised by 20 billion over 10 years providing finance to develop new innovation and a national infrastructure fund, adding another 20 billion for key infrastructure projects. This is bold and ambitious. A fundamental review of procurement, including NPD and PFI, with projects bought out if financially beneficial to do so. A Brexit strategy that puts jobs, living standards, consumer environmental protection and workers' rights at its heart. Investment in our health and social care system to address staff shortages, end boarding out, end bed blocking and ward closures and the crisis in social care that is here and now. And the common sense ownership of rail services, ending the, wa ending the waste and nonsense of privatisation where money seeps out the system. The re-regulation of bus services, investment in green buses is all very well, but in my region people just want a bus. Deliver a fair deal for our teachers, classroom assistants and council workers. They are at the cutting edge of delivering public services, the services that civilise us as a, as a society and who have a key role in reducing inequality and providing educational opportunities for all. And let me tell you what they don't want. They don't want a plan for Scotland drawn up in the SNP's cuts commissions by the Cabinet Secretary himself and Kate Forbes and Shirley Ann Somerville and corporate lobbyist Andrew Wilson because it proposes a decade of cuts. The continuation of failed ultra free market neoliberal dogma, an economy based on so-called flex security. Let me decode flex security for you. An economy where it's easier to sack people. And they have proposed nothing to address the hoarding of wealth by the 1%. Their plan would see, no thank you, their plan would see our public services. Their plan would see our sit public down, services down, being subject Arthur, to more job down. losses, more cuts and greater decline. Scottish Labour Party is serious about the challenges we face in a post-Brexit world. Part of the solution is bringing economic power into the hands of people and communities. We need common sense ownership and power decentralised. So it should be up to the City of Edinburgh Council if they want to introduce a tourist tax. It shouldn't be up to the Cabinet Secretary for Culture nor the First Minister. The railways should be publicly owned so that we can keep fares affordable and invest in the services without leaking money to shareholders. This is common sense and we should see powers devolved down to allow mo local models of ownership to flourish. President officer, the choice in Scotland is now clear. We continue with, can continue with cuts and austerity championed by the Tories and, <coughs> and meekly followed by the SNP or we can choose a different path, one championed by Scottish Labour, a programme based on hope and ambition that will deliver 
a progressive agenda to revitalise communities and end the attacks on the living standards of working people. It's time for real change, not another year of tinkering around the edges. Thank you. I call Michael Matheson. Mr Matheson, please. Thank you, President Officer. Now, this is a programme for government that is a, a, basically a, a contrast of two governments. A government is committed to taking Scotland forward, modernising its infrastructure, investing in its economy and making it a modern, vibrant nation. To a government at Westminster that is in utter chaos and goes from one day's crisis to the next day's crisis. But I want to touch on a number of points that have been raised during the course of this debate. A number of members have made reference to the number of bills that are contained within this particular legislative programme. But I want to deal with this misleading narrative that some members want to create around how you measure a programme for government is based upon the number of bills that have been progressed through Parliament. And in particular, the point that was made by Jackie Bailey on the number of bills that have gone through Parliament over the course of the year. Uh, Jackie Bailey has been in this place for as long as I have been here, since 1999, as a former minister. She knows very well there are a variety of reasons as to why the pace of bills go through Parliament at a particular point due to committee and parliamentary processes. But equally, she also knows that the measure of a government's activity is not just about legislation, it's about its wider policy agenda as well. And this programme for government is committed to a range of ambitious policy initiatives that we will take forward over the course of the next year. I'll give way to Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey, I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary. I think, um, you know, he has indeed been here as long as me. And I don't think in any of those 19 years, the government have produced as few as two bills. But he would also acknowledge, I think, that I recognise that it was also about policy and resources. Um, you're failing on those counts too. See, Jackie Michael Bailey wrong Matheson. on that matter because if she goes back to the beginning of the Scottish Parliament, there was a real lack of legislation at that point from her own government, the government that she was a member of at that particular point. But anyway, it's a narrative which the member knows is clearly not accurate. But I want to turn to some of the points which were raised regarding bills in this parliament. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, in the course of his uh, contribution, raised issues of concern around matters relating to non-domestic rates and how they apply to uh, former uh, fish factories in his constituency. And as the member is aware, there's a bill coming before parliament which will give an opportunity for these matters to be debated and to be considered. Alongside that, the South of Scotland Enterprise Agency bill, which will be introduced in order to make sure we're strengthening the economy in the south of Scotland. And when I was in Stranra a couple of weeks ago, at the invitation of Emma Harper, there's a clear desire there to make sure that we do everything we can to strengthen the economy in the south of Scotland. And this government is bringing forward legislation to help facilitate that. The biometrics bill that was referred to by Stuart Stevenson, I can't say that I know much about the uh, Indian government's ID card system that the member made uh, reference to, but the biometrics bill is about modernising our legislative structure for dealing with the ever-emerging new way in which biometrics data is progressing and in making sure that we future-proof our approach to how that is managed in the future. And I want to finally turn to the issue of our justice system here in Scotland. We should always be minded to look about how we can improve and develop our justice system in Scotland, look for new ideas and approaches that can enhance how we deal with our justice system and the matters within our uh, within, our, uh, within our Scottish justice system. But I'll tell you one thing, presiding officer. From a party that's cut 20,000 police officers, crime up right across the board, prisons in a meltdown, and a government that has no idea on its justice policy at Westminster, the Conservative Party is not the party we'll listen to when it comes to justice matters in Scotland. But, presiding officer, a key part of the programme for government is to make sure that we invest in our economy and that we make sure that we create inclusive growth as part of our economic drive. And a key part of the programme for government is our investment in national infrastructure because there's absolutely no doubt that national infrastructure plays a key part to delivering that inclusive growth. But we only have to look at the history, particularly of UK governments, where infrastructure investment has lagged behind that of OECD countries and G7 countries. So we're leaving the UK to lag behind. 
We are setting out a national infrastructure mission, one which will see an increase of some £7 billion being invested within our infrastructure here in Scotland by 2025-2026. And I listened to Rachel Hamilton in her contribution, complaining that the programme for government says nothing about investing in our national infrastructure. At the very heart of our programme for government is this record increase in investment in our national infrastructure. And that would deliver real change, real change to communities right across the Scotland, local, regional and national, from the health service to our education system, to our transport system and to our other public services. It will make a real change and it just serves to demonstrate the ambition that we have to grow the economy here in Scotland. I'll give way to Rachel Hamilton. Rachel Hamilton. Um, in the programme for government, it, spe it specifically didn't list its very of woolly statement. I'm hoping that you will commit to some of the tourism problems that are happening within the communities with regards to the NC500, for example, the car parking at Glenfinnan. These are the things that you need to be, the government need to be looking at. Cabinet you know, Secretary. Uh, I, must, I, must, I, I know the member has an interest in these matters. Can I say that I, I think the member will recognise but it's important that we look at all aspects of our economy, including the tourism economy, to make sure we're getting the right investment to deliver the maximum economic benefit that can come from that. And by increasing our infrastructure spend, it gives us the opportunity to take that forward. And as the First Minister said yesterday, I will set out in the months ahead how we will take that programme of work forward right across government. But let's just uh, recognise the very significant level of infrastructure investment that's already taken place here in Scotland and is still ongoing. We've just passed the first anniversary of the fantastic Queensferry Crossing, creating greater connectivity between Fife and the Lothians and greater reliability in that crossing from what we had before. The delivery of the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route is expected, expected to generate £6 billion of additional income into the northeast of Scotland's economy, creating some 14,000 jobs in its first 30 years of operation. That's investing in infrastructure that will drive the economy forward in the northeast of Scotland. Three billion pounds of investment in the drilling of the A9 between Perth and Inverness. Again, the biggest infrastructure project in Scotland's history, delivering economic benefits right across the Highlands as a result of that major investment. And since 2007, £8 billion of investment in our rail infrastructure and services. Increasing steering capacity and the number of services running, including the delivery of the Borders Railway, which has been a real success to the Borders economy and the people who live there. And I want to touch upon the other major change that we've made to support some of our more vulnerable communities through the introduction of RET on our ferries, creating a real boost to our yeah. local economies right across the Highlands and in our rural communities. Sign officer, alongside that, with our investment in digital, the investment, the record investment has grown so far into digital and the 660, uh, the 600 million pounds of investment in the R100 programme will make a real difference in connecting communities right across this country, country through super fast broadband. So I offer this is a programme for government that's delivering for us today and it will invest in Scotland for tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much. And we move on now to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 13747 in the name of Graham Day, setting out a business programme. And members may recall that following the recommendation of the Commission on Parliamentary Reform, uh, yesterday the Parliament uh, agreed to vary the rule on business motions to allow any members to speak on the motion uh, at my discretion, although no member has indicated the wish to do so. So I call on Graham Day on behalf of the Parliament, Parliament Tribune to move the motion. Uh, moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. No member wants to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 13747 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of business motions 13745 on extension of a stage one timetable and 13746 on a stage two timetable. Uh, does any member object to either of these motions? No. I call on Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motions. Uh, moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you. 
No one wishes to speak against the motions. The question is that motions 13745 and 13746 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. Can I ask Graham D on behalf of the bureau to move motion 13744 on designation of a lead committee and motion 13748 on parliamentary recess dates? Uh, move, presiding officer. Now, I wish a member wishes to speak against the motion on parliamentary recess dates. I call Elaine Smith. Thank you, presiding officer. I do not wish to speak against the motion, but I do wish to speak on the motion, and I look, I'm look seeking some clarification from the Minister for Parliamentary Business, if that's acceptable. That is acceptable. Thank you. So, since its inception, the Scottish Parliament has taken a family-friendly approach to the conduct of parliamentary business, including ensuring that our recess dates take cognizance of Scottish school holidays. This applies not only to elected members, but it also applies to MSP staff and to all of the Scottish Parliament staff, and indeed, our Standing Orders Rule 2.3.2 says, in considering dates of any parliamentary recess, the Parliamentary Bureau shall have regard to the dates when schools in any part of Scotland are to be on holiday. The Parliament recess dates, presiding officer for 2019, were agreed by this Scottish Parliament when we met in June. And this motion before us seeks to change the agreed and publicly advertised Easter recess dates which for the past number of years have been set as the first two weeks in April. Now, I believe that this is due to Brexit, but perhaps the Minister could clarify that in summing up. And if that is the case, then the Brexit date is not a surprise. It was known when this Parliament agreed these dates in June, and it had been known for some time before that. What was a surprise was the Minister for Parliamentary Business's intention to seek to overturn the previous decision of the Parliament on this issue. And as far as I'm aware, no advance notice was given to allow discussion of this decision by MSPs or staff trade unions or others with an interest in the matter. So on a decision of yesterday's Bureau, it's proposed that our Parliament Easter recess dates will now coincide with the English school holidays and the city of Edinburgh, but the majority of Scottish schools, which members may wish to listen to this because it does cover their areas, the majority of Scottish school holidays are scheduled as usual for the first two weeks in April 2019. So specifically, can I ask what consultation the Minister for Parliamentary Business undertook with staff side trade unions before proposing this change to the Bureau? And whilst I do not intend at this late stage to vote against this, I do want assurances that in future, no decisions are taken which impact on the family-friendly framework of this Parliament without full consultation and enough time to fully consult. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And could I call on Graeme Day uh, to respond on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this was a unanimous decision of the Bureau, which reflects the huge significance of Brexit for Scotland and this Parliament. Brexit will weigh heavily on the deliberations and actions of the Scottish Parliament over the next six months and beyond. Given that, it was, from the perspective of business managers, inappropriate for this Parliament to rise for the Easter recess on the eve of Brexit Day, especially given the unfolding and still uncertain nature of Brexit. I note the point Elaine Smith makes about having regard to school holidays, but it is, of course, a situation that Scottish Easter school holidays are variable across the country. And, I, and we took this decision now in part to avoid inconvenience to members and staff, giving ample notice of when the Easter recess will begin to minimise the risk to colleagues finding themselves having to cancel arrangements. Thank you very much. And I thank the member for the uh, advance notice of the question. So we turn now to decision time and there are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 13744 in the name of Graeme Day on designation of a lead committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And the second question is that motion 13748 in the name of Graeme Day on parliamentary recess dates be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll move on now to members' business. Business is in the name of Keith Brown on the University of Stirling. We'll just take a few moments for members to, and the ministers to change their seats. <laughs>